Greetings, everyone. Uh, uh, glad to visit you all uh, by uh, video conference here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, inferences on soil nutrients and carbon from long-term experiments, grass experiments in the temperate climate. And I want to recognize the co-authors, uh, Derek Hunt, uh, Kirsten Hanam, and Alan Franzlubers. So there's a long-standing goal uh, with effective utilization of manure nutrients and uh, for soil improvement. And uh, uh, while we are trying to avoid environmental impact and all this remains a challenge, the main challenges of effective manure use are uh, nutrient imbalances, nutrient losses, slow and unpredictable release of manure nutrients and logistics related to hauling and spreading. So manure management is now a central, uh, central to the commitment of the Canadian dairy industry towards zero net carbon by 2050. And this requires reduced inputs of chemical fertilizers such as nitrogen and phosphorus and others, staunch losses of manure nutrients to air and to water, and lower accumulation of damaging nutrients in soils such as phosphorus especially, and finally maximum soil accumulation and sequestration of carbon from manure. So our first objective in this presentation is to describe improved methods for effectively using manure nutrients for perennial grass production. And the second objective is to assess the long-term effects on the soil with enhanced application measures uh, for dairy slurry on grass crops. So the measures that we're looking at are first and foremost, uh, low emission manure, slurry manure applicators. That, and we're using, we use mainly the trailing host technique and uh, the advantage of that is uh, that we, uh, it helps to conserve ammonium nitrogen. It's a precision application method and uh, there's odor reduction. And finally, there's reduced grass injury and contamination. And in this talk, I'll also be talking about our um, system for manure separation uh, by passive settling, low cost passive settling. And this creates a thin uh, supernatant uh, fraction with a high N to P ratio and uh, this is, uh, this we decant. And it also leaves a thick sludge at the bottom with a low N to P ratio, uh, which is precision injected into corn. And I won't be addressing that here, but I will say a couple of words just for the sake of completeness. And this is what we do with the sludge fraction. We inject it at corn row spacing. We precision plant uh, the corn a few days later on top of the sludge furrows. And uh, that provides, and we've shown that that provides uh, the benefit of uh, or replace can replace side banded mineral fertilizer, but I won't be talking about that. Uh, what I will uh, talk about here is the long term trials and why we use long term trials. Uh, it, it helps us to assess the efficiency of manure inputs and represents uh, a wide variety of uh, typical seasonal variation and it uh, enables us to account for legacy nutrients and uh, and also minimizes the effect of previous field uses, which is sometimes uh, difficult to account for in shorter term experiments. So to talk about, uh, to get to the results uh, from a near separation project. So this is the supernatant that I was referring to, and this is the efficacy of nitrogen uptake in grass over several years, eight year average. And comparing the uh, low solid fraction, the supernatant that we decanted with the whole slurry, and you can see that there is a much higher a nitrogen use efficiency with the uh, liquid, low liquid uh, fraction on equivalent amounts of nitrogen. And this we attribute to uh, both lower emissions of ammonia and also to a lower percentage of organic nitrogen, uh, which it would not be released quickly or even if at all. And uh, there is a line there, a dotted line, which shows the one-to-one uh, -one ratio. And at the very low end, the one-to-one -one ratio is actually, we exceed that uh, and that's because uh, that shows the effect of the legacy nutrients. But once you get uh, to a uh, significant application rate, then uh, of course you go way below that one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, the other uh, important aspect of this is the phosphorus loading. So by using this so low uh, solid separation, we actually, uh, on an equivalent level of, of nitrogen, we uh, almost have the amount of uh, phosphorus loading, but for an equivalent level of yield, we more than have the uh, the uh, phosphorus loading on the soil. So this is an important benefit. And now what about the legacy effect? So uh, here we're looking at nitrogen, the legacy effect of nitrogen. And this is all the treatments that we have in the trial and it's 12 year average. And uh, 
so uh, what we did here was we looked at uh, after the 12 years planting corn and what was the corn uptake, uh, the corn nitrogen uptake uh, on the next, in the next two years without any additional nitrogen being applied. And we can see that uh, in the purple numbers, uh, the, uh, the effect relative to the control is quite small, uh, maybe 50 to 100 kilograms of N total uh, increase, <clears throat> a total of two years. And that's uh, with a, a 400 uh, kilogram per hectare application rate uh, with whole slurry and with fertilizer. And to get to a higher legacy effect, which is the red numbers down below, uh, then you have to go to a higher annual fertilizer application and uh, it, the whole slurry works much better than the uh, separated slurry. So, uh, so that shows, uh, interestingly, that the total amount of legacy effect from vast amounts of fertilizer or manure, particularly manure, is, is uh, small compared to the amount uh, in the control, which is the release of the nitrogen, mainly the release of nitrogen from the soil, but mainly also from the crop itself, from the grass itself. So there's a huge legacy effect from cultivating the grass and farmers see that because when they cultivate grass out, they don't usually need to fertilize with nitrogen for the next year or maybe year, uh, maybe a half an application the second year. And that we see, but it uh, very little really comes or comparatively little comes from the um, uh, ample application of nutrients. So uh, in conclusion, increase in the, up, uh, the separate liquid fraction increases the end uptake and then use efficiency of grass compared to whole slurry and has much lower soil P loading, but it's still somewhat excessive and has little effect on soil and storage by implication, uh, uh, also carbon storage. So now we're gonna look at the effect of the grass species because in order to assess the, uh, the efficacy and the long-term efficacy of nutrient use and these low application, these low emission methods, you have to take into account the grass species. Sometimes that's not done in studies, only a single grass is used, which is, normal, but uh, there are differences. Uh, so here we're comparing orchard grass, tall fescue, and perennial ryegrass. And you can see, first of all, uh, very clearly that the perennial ryegrass has a lower uptake uh, with all the fertilizer and, uh, and, and manure sources. It's just less than tall fescue and orchard grass in our climate. And that's because of a lower rate of uptake and uh, growth uh, during the kind of summer lull period uh, compared to, to the other grasses. Now, looking at the effect of the slurry, which is in that uh, red box, um, and you compare the orchard grass and tall fescue, and there's a tendency for the tall fescue, especially at the high rate, to have a higher nitrogen uptake uh, from slurry than the orchard grass. Now, if we look at uh, the fertilizer uh, uptake, well, it's the other way. The orchard grass has uh, higher and significantly higher uh, both rates uptake than the tall fescue. And we don't fully know the reason for that, but our suspicion is, and, and the way we explain that is uh, that uh, tall fescue has more more even seasonal growth, the more even growth over the growing season in orchard grass, which cl more closely resembles uh, the release of nitrogen uh, from the manure relative to fertilizer, which is of course uh, all immediately available. I uh, also wanted to point out just the overall efficacy of the slurry in this long-term trial, which takes into account the legacy effects. And even with taking that into account at equivalent, almost equivalent rate of, of nitrogen, the uh, uptake is more from the fertilizer than it is uh, from the slurry. So there is a, there is a, a, a penalty to pay uh, from the uh, nitrogen efficiency of the slurry, even in a long-term trial. Uh, uh, but uh, there are also benefits, and in this case, uh, the fertilizer uh, was fully amended with phosphorus and potassium and so on. Uh, so there was no other limiting factor other than the nitrogen. But in reality, the, the slurry of, of course provides those nutrients. So now let's just look at the uh, assessment of nitrogen use efficiency and, and our perception of what that means from the standpoint of long-term trials. And uh, here we're looking at uh, tall fescue. Uh, that's been our go-to grass. And so here, what we see is that there, uh, we calculated two uh, nitrogen use efficiencies. Now, the adjusted nitrogen use efficiency is the one that would typically be used um, from short-term uh, nitrogen trials, where the um, uh, the uh, effect uh, of uh, previous uh, the, the uh, from the soil, the effect of nitrogen release from the soil, is subtracted out by subtracting out the control. 
And uh, but here, because it's a long term trial, then we don't need to consider that because all the legacy effect is already encompassed in the uh, multi years, 15 years of this trial in this case. Uh, so uh, what we find is that, of course, there is uh, a higher a perception of higher nitrogen use efficiency uh, with the uh, unadjusted, the, the adjusted and the unadjusted, uh, we think is closer to the reality. But without getting into too much detail, it, the reality is probably somewhere in between, but closer to the unadjusted uh, nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, and part of the uh, effect of the nitrogen can be seen uh, in terms of the sequestration, which is indicated here. And so you can see that uh, there is a, almost no, well, there's no sequestration at low fertilizer application, which is still 200 kilograms per hectare. It's not trivial. And at high fertilizer, there is, uh, there is some legacy end. But really, to get the legacy end, you need to apply slurry. And slurry at the low and the high rate gives you that. Uh, the very last number is sort of of interest because it has its slurry plus fertilizer. And it seems that the fertilizer actually takes away some of the legacy effect of the slurry itself. And I'll show you that in a minute. Now, also, the soil organic matter, you can see that there's very little accumulation uh, from the fertilizer uh, applied grass even though the yield compared to the control is not shown here, but the yield is uh, two or three times higher than it is in the control. It's a lot more grass, but not a lot more soil organic carbon. Um, but there is certainly with the, uh, with the slurry, and this shows up even more uh, when we look at the, uh, uh, this, the layers of soil, especially at zero 10 centimeters, which of course with these systems, uh, a lot of the carbon would be at that, at that layer. Uh, and it's, uh, it would show up sooner. And what we can see here uh, is the, some, the effect that I showed and I spoke about before, which is the equivalent rate of manure, in one case in that red box, uh, the equivalent rate of manure at 400 kilograms of N, uh, manure and then 400 kilograms with fertilizer. And you can see that the fertilizer actually somewhat, not statistically, but uh, this seems to be a trend uh, for lowering, certainly not enhancing uh, the benefit of, uh, in terms of solar organic matter. Now here's what, with, with just simple mineral fertilizer, there's almost no benefit, even at the zero to 10 centimeter level. But then if we compare uh, uh, liquid uh, dairy manure, that's the LDN, the manure, the whole manure, with the mineral uh, fertilizer at exactly the same rate, and there is a statistically significant benefit at the same end rate to the manure relative to the, to the fertilizer. And the trend continues lower down, but uh, it would take longer for this to show up. So taking all that data together, if you just look at the plant biomass in relation to soil organic carbon, uh, there is no significant dip, 0.37, but it's not significant, but very significant at when you combine the plant and the soil car and the added uh, dairy slurry on, a, on the soil carbon effect. And the R square there is 0.8. So now we're taking some new samples and we hope to have some 28 year evaluation uh, later this year. The last point I wanted to make here uh, is uh, about grass termination. So this is nitrous oxide emissions and from uh, uh, 12 years of uh, manure and fertilizer application. And it's a three year average that's presented here. So first thing you can see is that the emissions are somewhat higher from the manure than they are from the fertilizer. And the other really interesting point is that the uh, termination by uh, herbicide, the emissions are higher than the termination by, uh, by tillage. And this is like, say, it's a three-year average. The effect was, was strong and consistent. And uh, of, uh, curio curiously, the emissions from nitrous oxide actually began uh, within a few days of the application of the herbicide, long before you saw any um, uh, damage to the crop. So conclusions, uh, substantial uh, technological improvements have been made to improve nutrient recovery and accumulation of soil organic matter from manure slurry. Uh, legacy labile nutrients came from grass biomass, while recalcitrant nitrogen and carbon uh, came more from the dairy manure solids. And slurry liquid fraction can replace fertilizer, but with limited benefits to soil organic carbon. And finally, and overall, uh, more practical strategies are still needed to exploit the beneficial attributes of manure while avoiding pollution. And with that, I say thank you from all of us who have been involved in this project.
Okay, very good. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Randy Jackson from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Randy, you, you tell us a little bit about uh, how carbon and soil health might change in, in the upper Midwest, please. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Alan, and thanks for the uh, invitation. Does one of these work? The middle? But for the uh, pointer. Oh, thanks. Okay, let me see if I can tell a quick story here. Uh, I have this question, are there agroecosystems that can store C? And we've heard a lot about this today already. Uh, this is a particularly hot topic, as you all know. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of work about this in the upper Midwest, in Wisconsin in particular. And so I'm just going to rapid fire give you a bunch of stories that grad students and postdocs and research scientists have developed over the last few years, and then see what we can make of the results that they've uh, taken away. Um, so uh, one of my predecessors, Josh, Josh Posner, who passed away uh, back in 2012, always said, start every talk uh, with the right temporal scale. And the right temporal scale for Wisconsin is that 17,000 years ago, the glacier had receded from southern Wisconsin, and then we had uh, about uh, uh, 14,000 years of rubble, and then we had about 3,000 years of prairie, and in those 3,000 years, up until about 1840, uh, a tremendous amount of soil accumulated in the upper Midwest in uh, what we now call the Corn Belt. But I call it the tall grass prairie. Uh, the tall grass prairie is still there. Most of the tall grass prairie is beneath our feet. It's what we take advantage of when we till soils and plant corn and when we plant soybeans and that sort of thing in that part of the world. <coughs> but you can see here that the tall grass prairie that runs through southern Wisconsin also is part of the prairie forest ecotone as we move into an oak savanna prairie complex. But lots of our soils are mollusols that, derived, uh, that were derived from prairie and lots of them are alpha sols that were derived uh, from uh, uh, under forests. And this is just an indication of that sort of pre-European uh, uh, turnover of the soil and all that, uh, what, what we looked like in terms of the amount of uh, savanna that we had and the cover of savanna, oak savanna, uh, and the amount of prairie in, in southern Wisconsin. And those prairies and savannas for thousands of years were managed very uh, were, were managed with disturbances like fire to round up game, to push game, to make vegetation green up so that game would be attracted to it, etc. So they were a high disturbance ecosystem. And of course we've moved into an even higher disturbance type of uh, agriculture in the upper Midwest. Um, some would call it extractive. I guess I'm one of those who might call it extractive in that it relies on a significant churning of the soil and really mining of that carbon that accumulated over thousands of years in order to be as productive as it is. And of course we try and enhance that productivity uh, with lots of inputs, whether it's steel inputs or fertilizer inputs. And we've done that with really uh, cataclysmic outcomes in the past. We've improved that significantly, but the outcomes are still devastating. The outcomes are still devastating to people in terms of nutrient loss into our waterways, in terms of carbon loss into the atmosphere, in terms of biodiversity loss. And so there's a lot of talk about, I can't get this pointer thing right, Ellen. A lot of talk about what is so-called regenerative agriculture and what would it look like in the upper Midwest. I like this cartoon because it's, uh, it points out uh, soil organic matter at the start of cultivation as soon as the plow came in and uh, tore up that tall grass prairie sod, you can see we liberated uh, about half of the carbon that was in that soil to the atmosphere, and then continue to mine it through the 20th century and into the 21st century. And so much of what people talk about as so-called regenerative agriculture, to me, can be defined by, do we have agricultural systems that can actually set us off on a new trajectory where we're actually accumulating carbon, which is what we've been talking about today. And for me, the only way that can happen 
is if the function, the ecosystem function of that original prairie is restored. It doesn't mean it has to be prairie grasses all the time everywhere, but we've got to have that function. And Maria spoke about this. The inputs of carbon have to be greater than the outputs. There's just no way around that algebra. It's not even algebra, is it? I, I, whatever it is, it's math. Um, and so that's what we're uh, working on in the upper Midwest, trying to figure out what might do that. So I want to acknowledge one of my co-authors on the, or my co-author on this paper, uh, John Steyer, who is a turf grass uh, specialist in Wisconsin when I got there. And uh, he and I uh, established this uh, experiment. Uh, when you work with turf grass specialists, you just drive right up to your plots on the turf grass. So there's our vehicle next to our field site, um, just for scale. But without getting into the details, we planted some prairie grasses. We planted some prairie forbs, some reed canary grass, which is a native grass to the upper Midwest, uh, but also our number one invasive plant. That's a story for another day. Fine fescue, which is a turf grass, and Kentucky bluegrass. And we did this in this big Latin square experimental design. Pretty cool stuff. No differences among several treatments that we applied, but the big picture takeaway was after only two years, we saw a significant loss of carbon across all five of those different types of grasses to the tune of 154 grams of carbon per meter squared to 15 centimeters. By year three, 300 grams of carbon lost. By year four, it looked like they were recovering and they had gotten to not significantly different from zero. So it took us four years to regain the carbon that we had lost when we did the initial planting of the crops. Now, for context, the soils that we're planting in here were highly disturbed to begin with, maybe not unlike restoring into a previous agricultural system. Here's the 14-year difference. We went back and those plots were there over time. We went back and uh, looked at them again 14 years on. And now, on average, although there are some significant differences among some of these treatments, but most of those systems had gained 300 grams of carbon per meter squared over 14 years, which I've translated into uh, a rate per year, and it's about a tenth of a ton of carbon per acre per year, which is significantly less than what the uh, carbon markets were paying last time we had a viable carbon market in uh, the upper Midwest. I think people got paid when they planted grasslands for about a, a ton of carbon per acre per year. So we've got to be careful with these systems. Carbon credits should be based on long-term grassland cover, not new plantings, is the takeaway message from that little vignette. So we have these soil health principles that are so important. We've got to minimize the soil disturbance and keep it covered and maximize diversity and maintain living roots and integrate livestock. And when you do all these things, or even if you do a few of them, you should be improving things. This superstar, Abby Algarten, is a grad student who just uh, graduated uh, working with Matt Ruark, published this work where she went around to 746 plots. No, she didn't do all that. She collected a bunch of other grad students' data as well. Um, but it ended up being a lot of pastures, a lot of alfalfa plots, a lot of annuals with manure, a lot of annuals with no manure. And in each of these categories is all manner of variation. For instance, continuously grazed pastures, rotationally grazed pastures, all kinds of uh, variation. Of course, the pastures, they get all five badges because they do all five of the soil health principles. The forage, they get smaller badges because they kind of step up to the soil health principles, but not totally. We can talk more about that if you want. The annuals with manure get three of the badges, and the annuals with no manure get two of the badges maybe if you minimize soil disturbance with no-till and keep the soil covered with cover crops if you do that. And of course, most of the annual cropping systems in our part of the world don't. So they looked at, she looked at soil organic matter, which to me is the main metric of a healthy soil. And what you see here is that obviously the pastures had a significantly greater amount of soil organic matter than all the other systems. But maybe more striking is that there were no differences in the other systems. No matter which of the badges, what combinations of the badges they got. So let's be careful here with soil health principles. 
let's be careful with advocating for, well, if you do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <coughs> Here's another superstar grad student, Ashley Becker, who went to 38 Wisconsin sites. She actually did go to all those sites. Cool season pastures, raised for three plus years all around southern Wisconsin. And one of the things that she came up with was that when she looked at the age of the pastures, there was a significant, you gotta squint a little bit hard, but not too hard to see that there was a significant positive relationship with pasture age and soil organic carbon. And the rate of change, if you will accept my space for time substitution here, which I usually am wringing my hands about, uh, is about 0.1 tons per acre per year. So the takeaway from these two experiments for me is that soil organic matter and carbon are affected when all five soil health principles are fully implemented, which is grazed grasslands. One more story here. Here's Josh Posner, who I told you likes to talk about glaciers. He started back in 1989 a long-term cropping systems trial where we've got everything but from continuous corn, intensely managed, lots of inputs, the best genetics every year, uh, organic corn, wheat uh, uh, cover crop, clover rotation, conventional corn and alfalfa, well-managed, cool season, rotationally grazed pastures by dairy heifers. Fortunately, he took one meter deep cores at one meter deep in our part of the world is that glacial rubble that got left behind So the, across the whole soil horizon uh, In 1989 and then we did it again in 2009 and we corrected for bulk density with an equivalent soil mass correction Which is a key methodology that We're actually looking at changes over time here not doing a space for time substitution and looking at the entire soil depth Again, you don't have to, okay, maybe now you don't have to squint very hard to see that none of the cropping systems that have any soil disturbance, which is to say all the annual grain crops and the corn and the alfalfa rotations lost a significant amount of carbon over that 20 year period. About 0.1 tons of carbon per acre per year. The only thing that didn't lose carbon was the well-managed grazed pasture. Now, interestingly, it didn't gain either overall. It did gain in the surface 30 centimeters, similar to what some of the stories we've heard today from other presenters, but from 30 to 90 centimeters it lost, offsetting the gains at, at the surface. So again, we have to be careful. It's not enough just to have pasture. It's gotta be well managed, and it might not just happen everywhere ev all the time. This is Claire Dietz, another rock star grad student who looked at some um, prairie grasslands that were part of this experiment. And some of them were burned and some of them were grazed and some of them were harvested for bioenergy. Some of them were tipped upside down and turned on their head. Anyway, we did everything we could to these grasslands. And I don't wanna walk through all the differences and all the treatments. The big picture was, here's some serious carbon sequestration over a 10 year period in these burned, high diverse prairie, highly diverse prairies. Now, some of you, I can see my friend Allison here is gonna say, oh, 25 species, that's not that diverse. But it's pretty diverse for a post-agricultural situation. But look what the burning does. We know that it makes a more homogeneous plant community. It drives us towards grasses. And when that happens, it tends to reduce the variation that we see in these other systems where the variability of having all these different species, some of them really productive, some of them not so productive, result in a lot of vari variability in carbon accumulation. Some plots lost carbon. These are side by side. Look at the low diversity prairie. Six species were sown, not very patchy. They were all grass species. They all significantly gained carbon, and I think the technical term here is a crap ton of carbon. Oh no, almost 0.9 tons of carbon per acre per year. So closer to that one ton per, year, uh, per acre per year number that I talked about uh, earlier. Now look at the switchgrass, which everybody loves for bioenergy. Three of the four treatments lost a crap ton of carbon. Why is this? 
We think it's related to complementarity. The switchgrass is incredibly productive, but probably only exploring a particular part of the soil and leaving something on the table in terms of carbon ac accumulation. We need that next rock star grad student to dig into that question. One of the things that um, Clarissa is helping us understand is that the deep soils are key to whether or not these systems are sources or sinks of carbon to the atmosphere. Again, important ramifications for things like carbon markets. If we're only measuring in the surface soils, we're not getting the full story, and we're not gonna get what we're paying for, and that's gonna backfire eventually. The systems that lost carbon, let's focus on the switchgrass, they lost carbon at depth, okay? The systems that gained carbon, they gained carbon at depth. We've gotta have grasslands in the upper Midwest, in Wisconsin, that are putting a significant amount of biomass below ground and below those surface horizons. Those are warm season prairie grasses. So diversity and composition, that story I told you I glossed over this, it's not just about diversity, it's also about composition. You gotta have the right plants there. You gotta have the most productive plants there to somebody else's point earlier. Uh, and the way they're managed are important for soil organic carbon change and deep soil matters for accounting. Let me summarize, healthy soil is growing, not shrinking. That's what regenerative means to me. I think that's what regenerative should mean to all of us. Um, carbon credits should be based on long-term grassland cover, not recent plantings. I think we're gonna get in a lot of trouble if we start peeing people for what happens this year. Soil organic matter seems to be affected when all five soil health principles are fully applied, which to me means well-managed grazed grasslands. Diversity, composition, and management in prairie matters for carbon. Deep soil is important, and we must restore the structure and manage well that structure to get the kind of functions that we need to provide for us to build carbon in the soil, to help stabilize climate, to hold on to nutrients, to help clean up our waters, to help promote biodiversity, and to help support vital, thriving communities that we need out on the landscape because the current agricultural system that we have in the upper Midwest is devastating to people. We've got to change it. Alan, I was waiting for you to cut me off, but you never gave me the hook. Thank you. I'm, I'm, can you ask the question one more time? Um, on the, you've presented a graph before with box plots, yeah. um, and on the left-hand side there was a treatment with nitrogen that seemed to be gaining carbon in yeah. the soil. Can you comment on why the nitrogen treatment might be? It, was it to do with legumes? Did legumes take, were they accounted for in the... Yeah, there were... Uh, there were few of any legumes, and because it was uh, managed uh, in many cases for bioenergy, I think that's when we added nitrogen as a, at replacement rates. So the amount of bi uh, biomass that we harvested every year, I think it was about 65 kilograms of nitrogen, we added that back as inorganic nitrogen, and there were no legumes in that mix. We gotta get the legumes back in the system to begin with. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Was there one? Anybody else? Well, I'm sure Randy would like to talk to you uh, outside of the room too, so. <laughs> and and uh, make sure that you talk to Maria. Uh, she, she's waiting for that argument, uh, but be respectful of them. All right, very good. Well, your last speaker is me. And I am going to try to uh, explain a little bit of a project that uh, Matt, I saw you, there, there's Matt Poor, one of my co-authors back there. 
uh, a li little bit of a topic that we tried to uh, use paired grasslands with croplands. And so the overall rationale of the project was that beef provides essential nutrients like protein, zinc, iron, and B12. Grass-fed beef has improved fatty acid ratios, such as omega-3 to omega-6, and conjugated linoleic acid to provide health, human health benefits. Cattle eating a diverse array of plants on pasture obtain a wide variety of phytochemicals and biochemicals with known anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, and cardioprotective effects that are concentrated in meat, such as terpenoids, phenols, carotenoids, antioxidants, peptides, and other bioreactive compounds. Cattle grazing pastures on nutrient-rich soils may have greater phytochemical richness of meat. So this is the, the fundamental basis of why we un undertook this uh, study. Basically, I'm going to share with you something most of you probably know already. I'll just repeat that. I mean, that's, that's some part of uh, agricultural science that we, we, we tend to do is just repeat things. There are also some things that I think are you m might, for some of you, be a little bit new, too. So you'll, you'll get the combination, and then you can argue with me out in the hallway, too, if, if you would like. All right, so the objective is to explore the soil plant beef consumer health connection in this project. That was our goal. Specifically, we wanted to, th this portion of the study was to characterize differences in soil properties between grazed pastures and neighboring cropland producing feed grains. So we were basically just trying to compare a, a perennial pasture with an annual cropping system that was producing grains to feed to uh, beef cattle in a feedlot. We sampled at uh, private farms at three different locations. They were at, in the Piedmont ma Major Land Resource Area in North Carolina on a sandy clay loam, uh, the Blue Ridge MLRA, in, which was a loam texture, and then down in, in the Blackland Prairie in Alabama, which was on a silty clay loam texture. These sites were really quite different. They were uh, managed differently over time, uh, but all of them had corn grain as, as, a, as a comparison uh, against the, the uh, grassland systems. They were planted pastures. Per, uh, this, this is a site of the cropland and the grassland in the Piedmont MLRA, sampled in May 2021, so about two years ago. This is of the Blackland Prairie, where uh, the, uh, the grassland on the right and the cropland, you see the corn emerging. This is a, a, a silty clay loam texture, uh, high, high, high uh, density, uh, relatively slow infiltration of water, sampled also in May. And then the final one sampled in May, where we're looking at cropland, uh, which was on more of a bottomland compared to uh, some of the uh, uh, slightly upland uh, grassland systems. So the sampling was with, uh, the, the sampling for me is really important to how we get the, the samples because, you know, once you get a sample, then you think, well, the important co part comes in the laboratory. And it, rightfully so, important things do come in the laboratory. But getting a, a, a good sample is really important as well. And that's where things uh, sometimes get messed up. Okay, we used a push probe. Uh, at uh, which is four center in, in, sorry, centimeter inside diameter to extract the zero to 10 centimeter depth. This is important to get a good surface sample because as we've seen in most presentations, the, the most carbon actually is concentrated near the surface. A drill auger was used uh, to get uh, depths of 10 to, 10, 20, 10 to 30 centimeters and 30 to 60 centimeters. And it was a composite of five cores at, at about 10 meter distance uh, from the, a central location. Four grassland fields were sampled on each farm, so four, uh, four different paddocks, uh, uh, sometimes geographically disparate, uh, less than a kilometer for sure on, on each farm, and four uh, zones in a neighboring cropland field. The soil processing was uh, not, not typical to two millimeters, but we, uh, in our lab, we, we sample or, or sieve only to 4.75 millimeters. We're trying to keep some of the aggregates of the, of the soil, and you see the, the effect that we're trying to homogenize. We need to homogenize to be able to get a good subsample because we're only sampling a very small portion of the soil. So some of the soil chemical analyses at the, at the top layer, the zero to 10 centimeter depth only, we saw very little differences ex in uh, soil pH. And on average, the soil pH was, was relatively good at all locations. So agricultural soils, uh, there was uh, relatively good pH. No real major differences except in the Blue Ridge where there was a significant difference, uh, cropland being greater than in pasture. For malic 3 uh, phosphorus, there was uh, also very little difference between cropland and pasture. And there was a wide range of conditions at, at each uh, location. 
There, there was the greater uh, pea in the cropland in the Piedmont than in the pasture, but at all the other locations there was no difference, and then on average, no difference in, uh, between the, the phosphorus in the cropland and the pasture. Potassium, no difference across the board, but uh, relatively significant amounts of potassium that were available at all locations. In, uh, for sulfur, there was also this, uh, at the Piedmont location, greater uh, sulfur under the cropland than pasture. So the end result, what I'm really trying to share with you is that if we only are interested in chemical properties, we're simply not finding much difference between an annual cropland and a, and a perennial grassland, at least in these uh, three pairs of farms that we sample. So on the physical analyses, we, we get a little bit different uh, results. This is just simply the sand concentration. And uh, uh, technically, sand concentration is, is just easier to get a better estimate than, say, clay. But this would be the inverse. Say, uh, clay and silt would be just simply 1,000 minus this number here. All right, there were no differences between cropland and pasture. So our soils were relatively similar uh, in this comparison. And you see that we had a wide range of the, of the sand concentration. Sid soil density is uh, a, a concept that maybe you're not familiar with, but it basically is the density in the laboratory after the sieving, but it's, it's a function of texture and, a, and organic matter. So it's, it's inc incorporating both of those indices into one, into sieve soil density. And we saw that the cropland had greater soil sieve, uh, sieve soil density, meaning that essentially it would lead to the next results that I'm going to share with you is that pastures had greater organic matter in this case because the texture was essentially not different. Water stable mean weight diameter. This is an uh, estimate of the size of the aggregates that are stable after immersing in water and we see that almost all the ca in, in all cases there was uh, greater stability of the aggregates under pasture than in cropland and on average across three locations it was, it was significant. So stability index is essentially the same kind of a measure. It's actually taking the dry distribution divided by the, uh, the wet distribution divided by the dry distribution and getting a percentage of, of material that actually falls apart. So you see that under pastures, 90%, more than 90% of the soil remains stable. It's, it's got very strong aggregates that are with, withstanding the, the force of water movement in, in um, for those aggregates, whereas cropland had, had lower levels because of their inherent uh, disturbance over time. And for our biological analyses at the top 10 centimeters, we also saw that total carbon was greater under pasture at all locations, and then on, across the average, there was a significantly great, greater carbon content in the top 10 centimeters. This is an important aspect. This is nothing new. This is, this is kind of boring stuff for soil scientists because we kind of know this already. Total nitrogen, same kind of thing. We cannot really have, uh, in uh, most agricultural systems, we can't really have uh, carbon uh, storage or carbon change without nitrogen change as well. They go together, they're, they're, they're interrelated. So we get significant nitrogen uh, accumulation. And for farmers, they really want to know about this because nitrogen is something that they're paying for as, as far as inputs. And they want to know that whether there's actually more nitrogen in the soil to actually become mineralized and, and become available. So we looked at the particulate organic carbon fraction as well. And we found that on the, on the top 10 centimeters, pastures had, had greater than un, under uh, cropland. And that's, that's not necessarily new uh, information either. And then this uh, final one, the soil test biological activity, I, I've used the acronym STBA. The pasture is greater than under, under uh, cropland, and significantly, uh, quite a bit uh, greater, uh, more than uh, twofold greater. And this is the actual biological activity of the carbon that actually highly relates to nitrogen mineralization as well. Okay, this is uh, the association between soil test biological activity and soil stability index. We think of uh, aggregation as a physical process, but it's mediated by the biology. And so the more biological activity we have, th those organisms are, are working on the, on the particles and the organic matter and gluing the aggregates together. And so you see here there's a, a significant positive relationship between the biological activity and soil stability index. Now this is the part that I think is going to be confusing for you and that is going to be new for you. So you, want, you might want to leave right now or you might want to argue with me out in the hallway and that's, that's fine. But I'm going to go to the uh, International uh, Year of Rangeland and Pastoralists meeting after this, okay? So Jim O'Rourke is, is going to uh, lead that. 
The, the, this is what I want to show you. We sampled down to th uh, 60 centimeters, right? So this is the depth distribution of total carbon at th these three li different locations. The green is under prairie or under uh, grassland, and then the red is under cropland. The carbon concentration at 30 centimeter depth is something that I believe is where the, the, the primary root zone ends and the secondary root zone begins. For most crops, more than 80% of, uh, well, not crops, but for, for many plants, more than 80% of the roots are occupying the top 30 centimeters. So the roots are concentrated in the top 30 centimeters. Yes, there's carbon below 30 centimeters. You can see it in these graphs, and you can see it in, our, in soils around the world. Mollusols tend to have much greater carbon concentration with depth. But in the southeastern U.S., let's just say that God didn't bless us with a whole lot of carbon. Whereas in the, in the, in the upper Midwest, there, there's a lot of carbon. And, and of course, it was natural soil formation factors that led to that, and we can explain it that way. But you can see that these three different soils had very different carbon concentration at 30 centimeter depth. This is an important aspect, and I'm gonna sh share you why. Basically, at 30 centimeter depth, I'm gonna tell you that that's, that's what uh, we don't, we're not gonna be able to change much below that. Maybe we can change a little bit. But in the, in the practical time frame of a generation of a farmer, they're not gonna be able to change much of this. The data are pretty compelling that I can make that statement, and that I'm going to use this red, bo this red box here now as a baseline condition to, to show, show with you that what can really be changed and what farmers do change is the carbon concentration above 30 centimeters. And so that's shown here in the green. So anything that's in the green uh, pe um, box here, well, it's not a box, but it, uh, the parallelogram, or no, I'm giving the wrong uh, term, polygon, that polygon there is, is the actual carbon accumulation that occurs due to management over the last 50 to 100 years, let's say. It, it's not well defined because I can't really define it, it's just a simple concept. But there's a, a, a difference between what was there and what can be changed. And what we change is in this upper surface. And this is the actual carbon concentration or carbon content that has been changed due to the root zone enrichment. This is not the carbon stock. The carbon stock would have to include all of the carbon. I've subtracted off the, the red box from the green polygon there. And you see that in three, two of the three sites, there was greater carbon accumulation in the root zone uh, with pasture than with cropland. And that blackland prairie is a very unique situation. As you can see, there were very strong differences in the carbon concentration with depth. This is a, a actually very unusual, and, and, and unfortunately, we were able to use this site because uh, it created this, uh, this uh, unusual situation. So there were two locations in this, uh, th this site, uh, two, two pastures, that had very high total soil carbon relative to total soil nitrogen. Well, but what that tells me is that there are inorganic carbon con uh, contents in this, in this carbon estimation, right? The pH was, was, was high, uh, if you remember some of the, the, the data that I showed in the table. So these two locations had inorganic carbonates uh, with depth. Th so therefore, I've taken those out. Otherwise, if we take those two out, we have a very strong relationship. We get a slope of 12 parts of carbon per par uh, part of nitrogen. This is textbook kind of uh, operation. We have a C to N ratio of 12. Okay, taking those two uh, pastures out, we can make some readjustment of that baseline condition. It does become significant. That's not really the, the main point, but it, because the, these two profiles, these two settings of the cropland and the pasture were in a little bit geographical diff, uh, setting, uh, they were approximately two kilometers apart in this case, they were different soils. This is kind of the point. When we sample uh, sites, we cannot verify that the, the authenticity of the sites that they're exactly the same soil type. Yes, they're mapped on, on an NRCS in the United States, NRCS map as a soil, same soil type. That doesn't mean that they're the same soil type. We have, and we cannot go back in time of a thousand years or more to understand, well, what were the factors? So this distribution with depth is really it revealing for me. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, and now t uh, show you about, we can do this with kind of any kind of organic fraction in soil. It's possible perhaps with some inorganic uh, elements, but I think it, the factors are different. With organic elements, this is soil test biological activity distribution with depth. We basically see a very strong pasture effect again. This is the 
biological activity enrichment in the root zone in the top 30 centimeters separated from that of the baseline condition. And it's very strong condition there. We see also that there, the, the biological activity at 30 centimeter depth isn't as strongly different among these soil types. And so the, the very low level of biological activity at depth is important. Okay, this is the root zone enrichment on the horizontal axis of, uh, of biological activity as a, as a predictor of soil test biological activity in the top 10, 10, 10 centimeters, independent of if, whether we use root zone or not. This is the ab absolute on the, on the y-axis versus the root zone enrichment. And as you see, there's a very strong relationship, and it, it, it's, the numbers might not mean a whole lot to, to me yet, but 71% of that root zone enrichment can be expressed by just simply measuring biological activity in the top 10 centimeters. So, so this is an important aspect that there is actually a relationship. So I think that the, uh, it would, it would verify that, that the, the root zone enrichment technique is actually measuring something real rather than just simply an artifact, which in fact you might believe or, or might argue with me. And I, I will continue to share data with you to argue against that. So the root zone enrichment of total soil carbon is also related to root zone enrichment of soil test biological activity. So there are two different uh, fractions of organic matter, one the total and one, one the very specific biologically active component. And they have this str very strong relationship. And so in this case, 14.2 as, as a slope would indicate that 1.4% of the total carbon is actually biologically active. So it's, it's uh, within the realm of, of reasonable approximation. In conclusion, on-farm assessment of soil organic carbon and nitrogen fractions and water-stable aggregation validated the assumption that pasture-based livestock farming systems are contributing to significant soil organic carbon and nitrogen accumulation and a diversity of ecosystem services related to water and nutrient cycle. The more information we gather, of course, the more we can say about these statements, but we have to, we have to back up these statements with data. Otherwise, we're, we're going to mislead the public, and that's not an, a good thing to do. So we need to have data. Soil profile distribution of soil carbon and nitrogen fractions contributes to a better understanding how management may be affecting soil carbon and nitrogen sequestration, especially under managed grazing. This can be done under managed grazing, but it can be done under any kind of conservation system. And the point that I want to make is that there's a, some way, uh, say, a debate in, in till, tilled versus no-till and whether uh, we store carbon. Con conventionally tilled uh, agroecosystems can store carbon in some situations. It depends on the initial starting conditions, and, and probably they lead to uh, uh, loss of carbon in, in other situations. But this technique allows us to estimate any kind of a system. Root zone enrichment calculations highlight important surface soil changes and yet integrate across soil profile characteristics. Because the, we want to know what happens at the surface because we know that that's where the action is going to be but we need to verify a little bit of what's going on under the soil. So I appreciate your time, and if you had any questions for Shabtai Bittman from the, the recorded presentation, you can send them to me as an email, or if you know his, uh, his contact information, you can send them to, to him as well. So I thank you for the, uh, your attention, and I thank all of these speakers for agreeing to present at, at the, uh, the thematic session here today. You got a, the audience got a rich idea of carbon changes in very different environments. We, we work in, in really quite uh, different environments, and management is also very different within an environment and across these environments. So we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, certainly, if we had common metrics, we could make some bold statements, but it's also good to, to simply be unique. And so I welcome your, your input. Thank you. Thank you, Valen, for, for this nice presentation. Uh, just if you express uh, your carbon concentration in terms of stock, do you think that you will find the same result? We, we, so I didn't show you the, the stocks, but of course I, I estimate the stocks as well. A lot of times there can't, well, sometimes there's no difference between root zone enrichment estimation and just total stocks. The problem, though, is that we're, we're trying to estimate stocks on disparate land uses where we don't really, we cannot confirm the, the authenticity of the same soil types. And that really matters. 
I'll just say that I've been sampling on private farms more now because we need to know what farmers are doing and how that management has changed over time. And that, okay, so on research experiments, we, we can say basically, well, in the past 10 years, we, we managed it this way. Well, what happened before those 10 years? The initial condition really does matter. So stocks can be important, but I believe that we're, we're, we're uh, misled. Let me just be bold enough, and, and, and Randy and I can fight in the hallway, uh, respectively, but, uh, uh, but the, the mollusols tend to have high carbon stocks. I got an email from a farmer just, just this morning saying that, that uh, he had some sampling done on his farm from another group. And while his soils, it happened to be from Virginia, his soils were on the very low end of the carbon stock estimation. But yet, under pasture management, I estimated that he was actually doing a really great job because th there was uh, around 40 tons that was in that root zone enrichment. So it's, it's something that can be significant. I would venture to say, and one of my papers, uh, I think it's been a couple of years ago, would say, say that actually the amount of carbon that that's, uh, can be stored in the root zone um, is in the southeastern U.S. in a warm, humid uh, cl climate is actually as, well, as much as in the mollusols. That narrative has never been approached before because there's a, there's a stock that was there already that if we only look at stocks, Wisconsin soils always win. And, and we're not after who wins, but it, it just shows that the stocks are, are, can be misleading. Yeah, but the stocks, Alan, you know that it is also subject to management. The management affects the stocks. I mean, it depends That's how right. it depends how your grassland is managed. How if you if you if you practice some misleading management, you can destock the system completely. I mean, you can lose carbon. We have we have we have to document the change in management. Yes, obviously, man, it, uh, ev the stock change to do, due to management is what we need to look for. Absolutely. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, you have to promise. Okay, okay, yes. All right. So, Alan, how does it, this concept could help us interpret soil health assessment? Because the main thing is, what do you, we compare with? Do you think we can use the same concept for soil health assessment? Yes, I believe so, because the, the, the change that occurs in total carbon is also being reflected in biological activity. It's being reflected in water holding capacity, in aggregate stability in, uh, well, I don't have too many data on biodiversity, but we have a few data on some biodiversity, but we need a whole lot more of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me also say, because when, when Maria showed her Spotosol uh, picture, this is one soil type of, of, of 12, uh, I think we have 12 yet in the, in the United States. Do we have 12 soil types in the soil, soil orders? There are, there are, I believe there are 12 so soil orders in the United States. Spodosols are, is the one soil t order that actually this doesn't really fit because of the different uh, translocation of, of carbon that, that, uh, that occurs. Alan, one more. Yeah. You mentioned that the farmer doesn't affect what's happening below 30 centimeters much. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we're really concerned about with our data is that we're starting to see a signal of a change in climate because in our part of the world, of course, it's for a long time been frozen all winter and now it's not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. And for a long time it's been freezing at night and now it's not so much anymore. And these are periods of time when there's no plant production, but the microbes are able to do their thing. Yeah. So we're wondering, are we seeing a signal already of a change in climate? And I, there's been actually some, some really good ecosystem ecology work in forests mainly, showing that even to a meter deep, uh, a meter depth, uh, ambient air temperatures can affect what's going on a meter deep. Have you seen or heard about any conversation around that in your part of the world? Sorry for the long-windedness. Okay, well, it's good that you use the microphone. I don't have to repeat it. So uh, actually, I have data myself that would indicate that yes, we, we've seen some change uh, at below 30 centimeters. Let me, let me just state that the, the concept isn't perfect. It's an indicator. I would say that it's actually another indicator of potential change. What I, wanted, what I really want to do with this is that we're, we're running around in the United States spending a lot of uh, billions of dollars, let's say, 
and we're, we're chasing something when in fact we, the vast majority of our change could be known if we actually characterize it properly. Now there are, I, I, I agree, there will be some exceptions, no doubt. It's not a perfect system, but, but I think in, in general we could characterize it much better. Thank you so much for your attendance and our session has closed. Thank you. Thank you.